there's so many advantages to working in a transdisciplinary model, but what do we potentially lose in terms of enculturating ourselves impartially in another discipline or in another mindset or in another practice context? Do we kind of lose some aspect of that provocateur role? And or how, how do you kind of manage that balance between having an outsider perspective and everybody having some semblance of an insider perspective so that they can work together? Yeah. Sorry, that's a very like late night question. No, it's okay. Um, I, I don't think, well, first of all, I never lose my provocateur okay. stance because I'm never actually an insider. I think becoming an insider, it's like, excuse me, like doing another PhD and working with some people for many, many years. Um, you know, and sometimes that's almost a safety net for me as well. It's okay to be the outsider sometimes. And she has served on the Australian Research Council's College of Experts. She holds numerous grants, some by the ARC, Canadian Institutes for Health Research, and Canada's Social Science and Humanities Research Council. She works with university and community partners across disciplines. She's the lead author of Looking for Information, Examining Research on How People Engage with Information, and she's also the editor in chief of the Annual Review of Information Science and Technology. Uh, she does all of this in addition to um, a, a, the considerable um, work of being a platform leader at the university. I know Lisa as a colleague, um, but also I, I know her as a tireless and generous leader here at RMIT. And I cannot imagine and you know, speaker of uh, to round us off. Happy to be here. Happy to be here at the end of day two. Um, thank you all for sticking it out. I said I'd have five people here because it's the end of day two, and I don't, and for that I'm very grateful. Um, but, but truly, um, this has been a very inspiring two days. Uh, and on the heels of what uh, Joe and Steph just presented, I thought what better way to actually close these two days than to actually do a bit of meta-level work, which I always love to do, to get people thinking about their own practice and to start thinking differently about where we might need that practice to go in the future. Um, I would like to acknowledge as well the people of the Woiwurrung and Woiwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded land we are conducting our business today and to pay my respect to ancestors and elders past and present. So for those of you who don't know me, or at least maybe only know me with my platform director hat on, I want to give you just a brief background into how I come uh, to this place and the topics that we're going to be talking about um, before running off to our, our busy lives. Um, I'm an information behavior scholar. That means I look at how people engage with information, how it affects decision making, how they make sense of the worlds in which they live. And I love to do that around technology stuff. Social media, AI, you name it. If it's tech enabled, then I'm there. Um, and I have always worked in a highly interdisciplinary frame that I recently started using that great word transdisciplinary because my work is truly that, even though lots of other people use the term in very loose ways. So if you look at the projects that I've done over my career, day study, some media scholars, um, because while there's much wrong with the power relations through which emotional technologies are usually deployed, my critique is really focused then on something else. It's not on what the tech does and what's wrong with what the tech does. It's actually really about why the technology won't work. So that's what's wrong with the dominant narratives from the perspective of my critique. They don't account for why emerging technologies don't have the so-called impact that they're meant to have. Why don't? Why doesn't tech for good make society better? 
it doesn't usually. Um, there are many, many examples um, of the kinds of predictions about emerging technologies that are around. And the most typical ones that I've talked about in research work are kind of things like self-driving cars. But actually, one of my recent most favourite ones was about flying cars, actually. One of the big four consultancies recently um, had an article out on their website which suggested that flying cars are much closer in the coming, going to be in our lives, in the world, much closer in our future than we had expected, just in a few years' time. And that they had consulted experts to get this view. Can anybody guess who the experts were and how many there were? Three. 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 modern technology. So I'd, I'd like to hear what the panels think about what I just said. I love this question. I love this question. I totally agree with you. Every single technology excludes someone. And what's interesting is that we've also got a lot of research on this exact situation, being at a conference, asking questions. We know, for example, that if a woman asks a question first in the audience, more women will follow and ask questions. And we also know that many people engage with the content, but won't put their hand up, won't speak in front of other people. And so to me, the value of a system like Menti is that it can give a voice to people who might otherwise not feel safe to comment or to answer a question even while it may exclude others. So I think these are fabulous questions. I don't have a solution as to how do we make 100% of people you know, able to answer, feel included, feel welcome. We need multiple approaches always. And you may be happy to know that we do have a planned Q&A after we were gonna play with the tech. So we were actually thinking about that from the beginning. Yeah, thanks. The, the other thing that I wanted to, to highlight was that um, it's also an opportunity to have more feedback from the audience than if we do sequentially, because unfortunately we don't have uh, the luxury of time to, uh, to hear every single one of you uh, linearly. Uh, but it will work. But it will work. Maybe, maybe we are lucky and we don't have anything. So let me see. So 23, 24 participants. So, and I acknowledge that it's not all the participants in the audience, and we'll have time to hear through uh, complementary answers about what the, are some features that you think that are uh, features of a healthy information environment. I'm glad to see uh, some of the keywords that are most frequent as transparent, transparency, accessibility, inclusive. Diverse, which is a perfect segue <laughs> of what we just discussed. Security, govern, accessible, reliability, participatory, evidence based, equal opportunities, trustworthy, accountable. So keep this in mind. Now, what we are going to ask is about potential threats
today's um, headline keynote uh, from Julia Powell. Julia Powell is the director of the Tech and Policy Lab at the University of Western Australia, where she's also an associate professor of law and technology. Julia is well known internationally for her expertise in areas of privacy, intellectual property, internet governance, and the law and politics of data automation and artificial intelligence. She's been at the forefront of many unflinching analyses and public investigations of how big tech companies evade or distort regulations. She studied genetics, biophysics, and law at the Australian National University before, um, and also at the University of Western Australia, um, before heading off to the uh, University of Oxford um, and the University of Cambridge for her master's and PhD. She just returned, maybe a couple of weeks ago, from a, a visiting research position at Stanford University's Digital, Digital Civil Society Lab. Um, and in addition to leading a center at the University of Western Australia on technology and policy, uh, Julia also serves on multiple Australian uh, committees at the federal and state level dedicated to um, issues of generative AI in education, privacy, and, uh, it, it, sorry, generative AI in education, um, committees on privacy and responsible information sharing, responsible AI, and robotics. I met Julia in uh, 2020 when we co-organized the 2020 version of the AI Ethics and Society Conference in New York. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome her to this Society 5.0 Ethics event. Um, and I'm really looking forward to having you talk about big tech AI and reclaiming the future. So please welcome Julia Cross. Thanks so much, Janet. And I just also wanted to add my thanks. I've been really uh, treasuring the times where we gathered together in person and trying to really be very present. I think as the kaleidoscope of talks and events, I'm, I just think it's fabulous. I'm completely captivated by our translators um, in, in all forms. And I think that seems to me like it's one major part of this convening is to bring different kinds of expertise together uh, to really have a conversation. And one of the things that I think we're at risk of losing is our confidence in our conversation as kind of a foundation of any sort of change. And I think Annette and Lisa gave me a very clear prescription that my job for uh, this morning was to bring um, big tech into the conversation uh, about how do we proactively anticipate um, and respond to tech disruptive futures. And one of the things that I think we're in the midst of is an attack from big tech on some of the foundations of how we work and communicate and make change, which is to be in person, to trust this human brain as a processing machine of information and not just think that we are repositories of information but uh, are perhaps an inefficient way of working together. And I'll just give one little note from Stanford that to me was quite chilling. Some of you might uh, know the field of deliberative democracy as a mechanism for responding to societal challenges. Uh, there's many forms of it, but some of the most exciting, I think, is work on citizen juries, which um, as a lawyer, the kind of notion is in the same way that you can take a community of 12 peers and be in a position to judge um, criminal matter. People could be exposed for three days. In this country, we've led the world in uh, citizen juries on topics like genetics. And then you could bring a lay community of people together, inform them, and have them make decisions on behalf of so as a professor at Stanford, 
and go talk and say, oh, this is not this idea about um, deliberative democracy. And at Stanford, they've just realized that user-centric can now become society-centric, but they want to do it as efficiently as possible. So he said, well, isn't there this problem of scale with a citizenship? Clearly, I haven't read much about how that actually works, but isn't there this problem of scale? Why don't we simulate population? Like whole population, then we won't miss anybody. We'll just simulate everybody. And it just felt to me like this absolute chilling caution of these ideas that I think are so readily mobilized about ideas of inclusion um, and scale and what they lose, which is everything that matters. I mean, a simulated synthetic data version of you is, I think, such a poor reductionist rendering, it abandons everything of the messiness of the data band, it certainly abandons everything of interaction. So whether you're deep in the field or interested broadly, I think what I hope to add to is a sense that we actually know so much that can help us in responding to the challenges of technology. And part of the work of capitalism in this domain is to have us abandon what we know. And so I'm going to send that very much with uh, Big Tech, um, which is the topic I study from a legal perspective. And I'm going to bring in a bit of law because I think it's one of the tools that we can use to really arm ourselves for uh, what we face with um, society 5.0. So what I'm going to do is go through how I diagnose one of the big challenges in our uh, society life on the ethics, how we got here, uh, where are they taking us, where think they're taking us, what we do. And the problem, I think, is that in too much of our talk about tech ethics, we don't centre what are now the most powerful firms we've ever uh, encountered. How they got here is that they've also crafted a degree of legal impunity that makes them really untouchable. In a, in a way that I think is unmatched historically. Uh, the work of legal impunity is matched by a really powerful narrative. And this is more adjacent uh, to my interest. I work some time in journalism, I'm a speechwriter, I love words, and my feeling is that many of the words we need have been stolen uh, by industry. As an example, Complete lawlessness has been um, valorized as disruption and innovation. And we really need to watch those words and work with how we, how we read them. The narrative is doing so much to take us away from the decisions we need, and I'm going to end with some of my preliminary thoughts on some options for bringing what I think this conversation is uniquely uh, doing, which is to bring normative ideas into a conversation about uh, the ethics we need to be able to challenge the tech. So I want to talk about big tech and uh, ethical dilemmas and reminds us that um, in order to deal with these um, complex issues, we really need to complexify our current mindsets. Um, and not just about like how to use technologies effectively or you know, try to solve all the complexities that they bring, but to actually recenter what's actually important, which we find to be society, right? whatever that means. And that's not a, a, a comfortable term. Right? Society is, a, is as vague as any other concept. And, and I, I mean, I might say, oh, I like the term sociology um, or the social rather than society. But, or, or others might say we need to be human focused rather than social focused. But one of the things is, is no matter what term we choose, society 5.0 or some other term, the, the society 5.0 ethics concept is meant to sort of um, help us disrupt our mindset about what do we want to become? And then how can we start having conversations that will help us get a little bit ahead of the curve to kind of look at not the not quite yet. So 
sort of think otherwise by looking at the non plugged in. So it takes a future oriented perspective. Um, we invited and curated the sessions that you'll encounter today to, um, to provoke thinking around the speculative futures, but also thinking about critical ethical and political issues, and um, to think about what, is it, what does it mean when we start to recenter and begin with the human as this, as this kind of and again, what does, and problematize what does that mean? The, the event is you know, two years in the making, um, and I am delighted to be able to actualize it here um, with my good colleague and co-organizer, Professor Lisa Gibbons, who's sitting in the back room. Um, the, The idea um, behind this event is that it's not a single event. I just want to mention that this is um, the beginning of a series, and um, each one seeks to take a different format and scope, but they're all intended to kind of bring together thought leaders, scientists, um, technologists, and policymakers from around um, the globe to to tackle some of these issues and to try to kind of work out the complexities of what does it mean to develop best practices for better ethical societal futures. So it seeks to kind of come down from the level of the United Nations sustainability development goals, which are very abstract, and 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 yet not be very and not come all the way down to very specific sectors where things become quite applied, but work somewhere in the middle. So that's the challenge of these events. Um, and uh, we have a great lineup for you, a full day of both um, keynote speeches and then other events, which I highly um, encourage. I went to um, a couple of the sessions yesterday that were inspirational and fun and, uh, and you know, mind-blowing. Um, so we have things like interactive panels um, and small seminars, workshop style. So please enjoy your day. Um, we, we have some wonderful support to make this event happen. Uh, as as you can see on the screen over to your right, um, we are joined by Alice Eaton, who's a graphic illustrator, who just said hello on the screen. And if you haven't seen a graphic illustration of talks before, um, it's a real treat. So please have a look at those. They'll be um, probably displayed on the screens around the building, and uh, the, especially the approach me and made the red carpet for me. So I've talked to a numerous organizations and then also with NGOs, think tanks. And in the last few years, basically these conversations prepared me to write this book as a sort of a consolidation of what it means to design and use the tech. Because the reason they're approaching me is they're very excited about my work and I think, oh, that not that great? But actually what they really want is for me to just quickly deliver to them the next billion user market. In fact, in, you know, when my book, The Next Billion Users came out in 2019, basically every tech company got the next billion user lab. So, and it's not a coincidence because 90% of young people in the world today live in the global south, you know. Uh, it's likely to happen and it creates spaces within which um, publics can actually think about what might happen and embed those both concerns and fears and hopes into the way in which the technologies are created. 
The second uh, part of the acronym refers to reflection. And the idea here is to invent opportunities for ongoing reflection about the relevant issues that need um, to be thought about as this technology is either um, invented, deployed, redeployed, or whatever else. And here, the reflection also, importantly, involves self-critical analysis. It involves thinking about motivations, thinking about blind spots, thinking about assumptions, um, both in the science and in the domains where it will be deployed, which are decidedly social. The E refers to engagement, and here's where uh, publics are very important. As I said, they may have priorities, they may have hopes for technology, they also may have concerns and fears. And part of what needs to go on whenever you're engaging in technological development under an IR framework is thinking about creating opportunities for debate, deliberation around whatever the, the prospects and challenges are of the new technologies. And the final A then is to act. Um, too often, I think, in a lot of science and technology development, there is a lot of talking to people about what they might want and so on, and then scientists go on and do what they would have done anyway. Um, but to truly sort of engage in this um, deeper sense of um, responsible research and innovation, there is the need to think about how to structure and restructure activities so that there is alignment between publics and their values and understandings, um, hopes and fears of society as a whole, and um, a flushing out of um, the possible blind spots, um, vulnerabilities, and um, uh, neglect that could occur um, if things either happen too quickly or happen in a particular way. That can be inbuilt from the very beginning of um, thinking about a particular technology, a particular application, and so on. What this means then is that as part of the design, social risks and benefits need to be built in from the very beginning, and potential impacts, positive, negative, neutral, also need to be considered and inbuilt as part of the design. This means that it isn't just about you know, making whatever it is in such a way so that it works in a narrow sense, it also must work in this broader context of the social domain within which it's likely to be rolled out. And you can think of all of your favorite examples of this. Um, we do, um, for example, value um, all sorts of communication technologies. On the other hand, we also deeply value our privacy. We may well have values associated with health um, such that we are willing to have more tracking than we might have in the past. Um, but um, with regard to how the medical research, we always still hold quite central um, values relating to consent and um, willing participation and so on. In order then to be responsible by design, there's a need to engage the public um, that might be participating or affected by um, these technologies from the very beginning. And so that's side by side with the technical um, articulation details of building something, the social and ethical systems that are associated with the technology must also be built. So in some way, this takes us to a vision that is about responsibility 5.0. And this really could be argued to be a quite distinct sense of responsibility than we've had in the past. So if we think about our traditional senses of responsibility I mentioned a little while ago, we think about, say, a scientist's responsibilities as he or she builds something in particular, sets on a certain line of research or whatever else. Uh, we tend to think responsibilities are closely related to our roles. You know who sings it? Shout it out.
Buy it, use it, break it, fix it, trash it, change it, belt, upgrade it, charge it, pawn it, zoom it, press it, snap it, work it, quick, erase it, write it, cut it, fix it, save it, load it, check it, quick, rewrite it, buy it, play it, burn it, rip it, drag it, drop it, sit and zip it, lock it, build it, roll it, find it, heal it, cut it, shut it, and lock it, search it, scroll it, close it, click it, press it, press it, press it, press it, press it, those guys are French. I'm not sure if you're European, and they wear those helmets. Uh, very future oriented band, if we can call them a band, but it's Euro. And this is called. researchers and academics from both MIT and our friends from across the sector, members of industry, community, and all our other partners. You have a thought-provoking couple of days ahead, as, and I think Lisa sort of set the scene for some of the things you're going to be doing. I think your important challenge is to position human concerns, a concern for our planet, the center of this technological revolution. And though it's not my personal field of expertise, as a, as a lawyer, I have enormous appreciation for the complexity of the challenge that faces you. And as chancellor of the university committed to both technology and to society, I have enormous respect for the importance and the urgency of what you're talking about. So I thank you for the vision and the energy you're bringing to this festival of ideas.